Welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans, where we work hard and play hard on our little corner of land in Iowa. My husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonite, or Horse and Buggy Mennonite, as some refer to them as. And although we are no longer part of that culture or community, we are intentional about passing on the old-fashioned skills of our childhood to the next generation. Welcome back everybody. In today's video, I am going to be answering some common questions that I get about our homestead, our family, and things like that. Um, because it's been a brand new chapter here on the homestead with Elvin and I becoming grandparents for the first time, and all the rest of the Zimmermans are now aunts and uncles, and this means that the new grandma has been in and out of her own kitchen too fast to film anything that I made this week um, because I don't want to miss out on any of that time with the grandbaby. Towards the end of this video, I will give you all the um, details on his birth and his name and do a little bit of a birth announcement with photos of him that I've gotten permission to share from our daughter and son-in-law. Um, but that means that this week's video is going to be more of a vlog style because those do not take up so much time. I can just answer the questions, stick all my little videos together, and publish it to YouTube. So thank you to those of you that stick around for these types of videos. And also thank you to everybody that watches our videos every week. Um, we do not have the fancy equipment or you know any of those um expensive resources that a lot of popular youtube channels have we are just living life and in the meantime we film a little bit here and there stick it together and make a video and you guys show up and watch it and we are constantly amazed and thankful for the amount of you that choose to watch our video when you could be watching a much more polished and professional type account. Um, so thank you for being here. So a very popular question that I've been getting for the last couple weeks now is about the plant hardiness zone and how the Department of Agriculture or the USDA has changed everything up and given everybody new zones, most of the US, given them new growing zones. And people are asking me if that's gonna change anything in the way I garden. And so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about that and my experience with the growing zones. And I visited a little bit with my family, my brother and my sister, two of my brothers and my sister, who have retail greenhouses and grow produce and really are, um, they work the land and that's how they support their family. And so I visited a little bit with them and they agreed with me. So the, I still remember the 2012 when they changed the hardiness zone in 2012. So what, what they're saying is the reason they changed it is because um, from 1990 to 2012, they made, they changed the hardiness zone according to the average temperature and the average first and last frost date from that time period. So from 1990 to 2012. So now we have gone from 2012 to 2023 and they documented all of those temperature, those average temperatures throughout that time. And so now they're just making adjustments again, according to that last chunk of time. But for those of us that have been gardening before 2012, you know, in the 90s 
through 2012, this doesn't really mean much to us at all. And it begs the question, in my mind anyway, it begs the question, if scripture tells us that a thousand years is like one day to God and human beings on average are only living, you know, 80, 90 years here in the U.S., um, and how long have we been, you know, keeping, how long have we been keeping records of average temperatures? How do we not know that this natural cycle of up and down in temperatures is much, much more spread out than 20 years or 30 years? This is all just exactly how God designed it. Um, so we're just along for the ride. So what does it mean for me? I have not paid it any attention. I didn't pay it any attention in 2012 when they changed it, and I'm not paying it any attention now. And here's why. So it's not gonna change the way I garden because when I garden, I know my, I know, okay, so previously we were in zone 4B and when I shopped for perennials, like fruit trees, you know, um, raspberries or perennial flowering plants, I always shop as if we were in zone three because that is the plants that are hardy where I live. That is my experience. We, and people tell us all the time, people on the internet and on Instagram say, wait, you can't grow peaches? I thought Iowa can grow peaches. All over the United States, there's little microclimates and nobody is here in this area taking the temperature every morning. So I am the best judge for our little microclimate here. It makes a difference. Do you live on the top of the hill or the bottom of the hill? And so when people tell me, yes, you can grow peach trees, there are peach trees that are zone hardy four or four. And I'm like, yes, I know. They say they're hardy to zone four, but guess what? We've tried them. We've tried them more than once in our 20 years of living here, our 25 years of living here. They are not hardy right here. So, South of us a ways, yes, they can grow one kind of peach trees. We cannot grow peach trees here. Um, the same with perennial plants. Um, you know, if I plant flower plants that say they're hardy to zone four, I better not get too attached to them because if I'm going to spend the money to buy a hydrangea bush or, you know, something, a butterfly bush that says it's zone hardy for zone four, I better not get too attached to it because yes, it might make it through the first winter or the second winter, but then guess what happens? We get a harsh winter or a period of an average winter. We can get a period of, for a whole week where temperatures go down below 20, like 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And guess what? That's gonna take that um, butterfly bush right out. So, my experience still tells me that if I want to be a successful, gar successful gardener of perennial plants, I need to garden. I need to plant perennial plants as if I was in zone three. Those trees and plants, I can get attached to. If I plant something <laughs> that says zone four, I better not get too attached to it because we get some really, really deep freezes and that's just what I've learned. So you can tell they changed us from a 4B to a 5A and it's not gonna change anything for me. I know for the last 25 years, I know what I can grow here. So the other thing that you need to be aware of when um, you're a gardener is your average first frost date. The average first, sorry, the average last frost date is most important. So that is when you can expect to have your last frost in the spring. And that's the most important one. The fall one, I don't worry about. But the spring one, I really watch when our average last frost date in the spring is. 
So as far as I'm aware, they have not changed the average first frost date or average last frost date. So our average last frost date is May 15th. So before that, I can put um, my cold loving crops like brassica and onions and peas and all those cold loving crops, I can put those out um, like two to three weeks before our average for uh, last frost date, as long as the soil is ready and you know it's not still covered with snow. So then when it comes to tomatoes and um, sweet corn and peppers, things that are um, sensitive to the cold and frost, I just start watching the forecast. And if there's, if when we get about to May 5th, May 10th, and I can't see any frost in the forecast, I'll go ahead and plant those. And if I can see frost in the forecast around May 15th, you know, a week after, a week before, I don't plant them out because I know that we've got a frost coming. Um, so just knowing your, la your expected, your average last frost date is way more valuable in your annual gardening than knowing your zone hardiness. Um, zone hardiness is valuable when you're planting perennials because that tells you how hardy something is and how cold of temperatures it can handle. Um, the other reason that your average first and last frost date is valuable when you're gardening as an annual gardener is because it tells you how long your growing season is. So our last frost date in the spring average is May 15th to September 15th. So that is our growing season. So things that need a long time to get ready are harder for us to grow. Like tomatoes, we rarely get a full crop of tomatoes because we'll have a frost in the fall before the plant has, is done producing we usually get enough. So that's another reason why your knowing your first and last frost date is valuable to the annual gardener because you'll know that, listen, if I don't get my tomatoes in, especially if you live in a short growing zone season like we do, if I don't get my tomatoes in as soon, around May 15th, um, I'm not gonna get as many tomatoes as I need. Um, or it'll, it can also tell you like if you want to um, plant multiple crops of something, like say sweet corn, you can also count the days and be like, okay, um, June 20th is the latest I can plant sweet corn if I want to get a sweet corn crop before our you know, first frost in the fall. So understanding your f average first and last frost date is very valuable to the annual gardener meaning the one, you know, if you're not planting fruit trees and perennial vegetable, uh, perennial fruit plants. Um, so there's kind of my take on how they've changed the hardiness zone. I'm not changing a thing. I'm going to garden the way I have for the last 20 plus years. And I'm just going to, as long as God provides land, moisture, and everything else that I need to garden, I will be gardening hand in hand with God, not with the USDA. Another question I get is about starting seedlings indoors. I have absolutely started seeds indoors, um, but as the family grew, I had much less space. And although I enjoy starting seedlings indoors, we don't have a lot of, we don't have a very large house and we have a very active family and every square inch of this house gets foot traffic and gets ball traffic and there's just no, I don't feel like there's any area in my home where I can carve out a corner for me to start seeds and then transplant them, you know, where they take up more room. And a lot of people have suggested you can do it in your basement and hang up grow lights. Um, but I don't enjoy being in the basement with grow lights. And I, I've actually tried that and my seedlings were not very hardy. 
And the second point is I have a brother and a sister who support their family with retail greenhouses. So I just go to them and I buy my seedlings. I'll go the day before or the day that I'm ready to plant tomatoes and I'll go to their greenhouse and I'll buy these beautiful, nice seedlings and I'll plant them out. Um, do I worry because they've been, you know, fertilized with synthetic fertilizer and, you know, grown in a potting soil mix that I might not cho choose myself? I don't worry about that. I'm going to put them in my garden and they're going to grow out of it. And I just buy whatever heirloom, whatever tomatoes my brother or my sister have in their greenhouse that are labeled heirloom tomatoes. I look for... I like the Goliath. I like, I think the other is the Big Boy. I like the Red Delicious. Those are all varieties I look for. And if they don't have any of those, guess what I plant? I plant the Romas or the Amish Paste Tomatoes. And <laughs> I've always been able to fill my shelves with plenty of tomato products by not starting my own tomatoes or any of my own seedlings. So no, you don't, you won't see me starting my own seedlings. I will, however, tell you that I'm very intrigued and interested in winter sowing. And because I have a cold frame, I'm experimenting a little bit with doing some winter sowing into my cold frame. So I will be interested to see how that turns out. Everybody wants to know about our journey out of the Mennonite culture. It's a very, very, everybody's very interested in that part of our story. So we left in 2007, and although I'm not going to go into detail today about that part of our journey, we are willing to share it. And if we could get somebody to interview us, so if you know of another channel that would be great for interviewing, interviewing us, and then we could both share it to our channel. Um, please reach out to them, let us know, and we'll reach out to them. Um, I don't want to, you know, answer questions without Elvin with me because it's as much his story as it is mine. Um, but I'd like to do it with um, more of an, an interview type than just us um, telling our story. Growing up Mennonite, um, in our family, we lived on the farm, and it was very, it was routine for my mother to give the whole family an herbal tincture that was a parasite cleanse, and this was common amongst the farmers in our area, the Mennonite farmers. If you have animals and you deworm your animals, you also deworm the humans, and it was a I was taught that all mammals have parasites and we do parasite cleanses to keep us from having too many parasites so that it affects your health. Um, and I've gotten shadow banned and in trouble on Instagram for talking about this subject. So I'm going to be very brief about parasite cleanses because I don't want YouTube to take down this video because I'm talking about parasites or like parasite cleanses. In my experience, YouTube has not been near as restrictive as Instagram. So when we left the Mennonites and I, in our new community, brought up the subject of parasites, it was like taboo. Like people did not want to talk about humans having parasites. And... I was, among all the other things that I had to learn about the non-Mennonite modern culture, that was a subject that I had to really learn that, oh, I got to keep this to myself. If my family and I are doing a parasite cleanse, nobody wants to know about it. Like everybody wants to continue to believe that humans don't have parasites. Um, but I will, I think... I can, I'm not sure, but I will in the description 
share the tincture that we use and the tincture that we use comes with instructions. It'll walk you through the whole thing. But it is my belief that if you have animals of any kind or you go where there are animals, you should do a once if not twice yearly gentle parasite cleanse to keep your body from getting an overload of parasites that can negatively affect your health. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you all the negative um, the side effects of having a parasite overload. Um, you can Google that for yourself um, and know that be long before Google, that was what my grandma and my mom were teaching me, is that you need to do a parasite cleanse. So the way parasites live in your body, um, and this is the way I was taught by my mom and my grandma. So if you have a medical degree, um, please excuse me if this is not the, the correct terminology. Um, but parasites, like your, your everyday type parasites that you're going to be in contact with, um, they will, they'll, they'll make their homes deep in the lining of your colon and the rest of your intestines. And that's where they'll live. And your immune system, your body has like your body will automatically expel the parasites as much as it can. But with the modern diet, the mucus that builds up in your colon and the rest of your intestines and your digestive system makes the habitat so that your body can often not um, naturally expel the parasites because our modern diets are so full of junk that the mucus lining is so deep that it just harbors, it can harbor so many parasites and that's when you start seeing um, negative health effects. So number one, keeping um, a clean diet um, will be your best defense. However, this is the way the herbal tinctures work. They're made of bitter herbs like wormwood and black walnut hull and peppermint oil, you know, things like that. So you're going to take this like three times a day and it's going to make the, your, so by taking it three times a day for, you know, like if the tincture that we use is five days in a row, it's going to make the lining, it's going to make your colon, your intestines, the lining of your intestines be bitter. And what happens when that all becomes bitter is the parasites don't like that and they come out of all of that lining and then your body knows exactly what to do with them. As soon as they come out, your body's going to get rid of them and flush them out. And then you're going to move on and your, your body's going to be able to work properly again because it's not, um, you know, it's not busy trying to expel something that it cannot expel. And those par parasites will no longer be there robbing your body of, of nutrients that it needs. So I'm going to do my best to link the product that we use but listen, if you've been inspired to do a parasite cleanse on your family, just look for, you can Google it, you can find product. I would recommend an herbal tincture because it's gentle on the stomach and it does not, we've never had any adverse side effects. Now for the announcement of our grandson. He was born on Palm Sunday and his name is Winston Martin Miller. Um, his great grandpa's name, first name was Martin and Martin is Elvin's middle name. So he's named after his great grandpa and Elvin. Um, we are 
completely, the whole family is smitten with this little boy. We couldn't be more proud. Our daughter has taken to motherhood like a duck to water. And um, one of the questions I've gotten is what kind of grandma and do I see myself being? Well, you've heard me talk about my grandma a lot and that is my paternal grandma. So all of my inspiration comes from her and my memories of being her granddaughter includes sitting beside her at the sewing machine, helping her in the kitchen, helping her in the garden. So that is the type of grandma I see myself being. It, and um, I just get a lot of warm, fuzzy feelings when I think of grandparents. And I hope to be the kind of grandma to our grandchildren as my paternal grandma was to me. And what grandma names are Elvin, what, what is the grandparent names that Elvin and I are going to have? And we are going to stick with the Pennsylvania Dutch um, title for grandma and grandpa. And for grandpa, that word is Dotty. And for grandma, it's mommy. So we will be mommy and Dotty. And in that way, we're going to keep our Pennsylvania Dutch heritage going for the next generation. That brings us to the end of this week's video. Thank you, everybody, for sharing in our excitement um, that the first member of the next generation has been added to our family. Yeah. We've also started getting some of the wedding photos back from our daughter's wedding last month. So I'm going to add a couple of those for you to enjoy. We will be back next week with um, probably another recipe because it doesn't look like we will be in the garden next week, according to the forecast. Also, next Friday and Saturday, my husband and I and a few of our children will be attending an Iowa Homestead Expo. And it is probably about, I think it's about th a three hour drive from our house, but I'm going to put the link to that in the description too. And if any of you local Iowa homesteaders will be there, please see if you can find us and stop us to say hi. We would love to connect with you. Um, don't forget that link is going to be in my, um, in the description. If you need help finding the description, if you go be right below this video, there is the word more and three little dots. If you click on those three little dots, it'll give you a drop down menu and there's where you can see all of our links. Thank you, we'll see you next week if we don't see you at the Homestead Expo.